Welcome to today's grammar lecture on conditional sentences and unmarked direction. Let's begin with conditional sentences. Any conditional sentence has two parts. You have the if part, the condition, which the fancy word is prodesis, and then you have the then part, the consequence, the fancy word is the apodesis. For example, if I say, if I drink coffee, if prodesis, then as a consequence, then I will have more energy. So if I drink coffee, then I'll have more energy. This is an example, 1 Kings 6.14, with a much longer conditional sentence. I'll read in Hebrew, translate, and then we'll talk about some observations about how Hebrew does this. Im telech bechukotai ve'et mishpatai ta'ase ve'shmarta et mitzvotai v'hakimoti et devarai Asher di Barti el David. Translation If you, God talking to Solomon, you walk in my statutes and my judgments you do, and you keep my commandments and I will raise up my word that I spoke to David. Now notice that Hebrew has a word to introduce the prodesis, im, and then you have a yiktol form, and then the prodesis is carried along by a vav, and then in this clause you also have a yiktol form. Here it's carried along by a vekatal, and then here you also have a vekatal. But here I'm noting that the apodesis starts here, even though it's a vekatal just like this one. So how do you know when you switch from the if part to the then part? Well, this is one example of a common way that Hebrew does it by switching a subject. So you have God speaking to Solomon all of these are ata forms. So if you, Solomon, walk, you do, and you keep, and now you have the then part when the subject switches, then I will establish my word that I spoke to David. So one common way Hebrew uh, notifies the apodesis is by a switch in subject. Knowing that is good because Hebrew does not have a word for then like in English. In Hebrew, it's like every uh, conditional sentence is like the English sentence, if I drink coffee, I will have more energy. And now let's look at a few conditional sentences that are introduced by key. The one from last slide with im, those conditional sentences are really straightforward. If im introduces a prodesis, it's just equivalent to English if. Key, on the other hand, is not so straightforward, as I think you've already noticed. One usage of key seems to be equivalent to im here, as in number two. This is from 2 Kings chapter 4, an enigmatic passage where an older prophet comes to a younger prophet and says this to him. Ki timtsa ish lo tevarechenu. So, as you're returning home, if... You find a man, do not bless him. Now, notice here that the apodesis I'm saying is begun with low, and you can tell that it, it's beginning here because there is no vav to carry on the prodesis. So, no vav, so then this next clause is the then part. So, if you find a man, then... Do not greet him with a blessing. And let's see, number three is a different use of key where it introduces a prodesis that is the cause of something. Here is a causal use of key. God speaking to the serpent. Ki asita zot arur ata. Because you have done this, 
cursed are you. And notice that the apodosis, the then part, once again is signaled because there is no vav before the second clause. So because you, the serpent, have done this, then you are cursed. All right, let's look at one more example of key introduces a conditional sentence. This one is a long one. This is yet another use of key where it introduces a temporal protasis. And in this case, it means when. Let me read it, translate it, and then we can talk about some observations from this example. Ki yeviacha el haaretz ven nashal goyim mipanecha unetanam lefanecha vehikitam hacharem tacharim otam lo tichrot lahem berit Velo techonem. So here we go. When he brings you, this is a who yiktol form referring to God, brings you, Israel, to the land, and he, avekatal, he loosens nations from before you, another who vekatal form, and he gives them to your face or before you, another vekatal form, but now an ata form, and you strike them, then you shall utterly destroy them, where this is an adverbial infinitive. So, hacharem, tacharim, you shall utterly destroy them. You shall not cut with them a covenant, and you shall not pity them. Okay, so this is talking about some future sets of events. In the future, a temporal clause. In this case, it means when, and you have yektol, vekatal, 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 and then now no vav. Now notice the first conditional sentence I gave you, I said that the apodosis was signaled by a change in subject. Elsewhere, I've told you that the apodosis is signaled by uh, no vav. Well, here we have both. So where does the apodosis start? Does the apodosis start in change of subject? Or does the apodosis start in, uh, with the no vav? In this case, I think the no vav has precedence over the change in subject. So all of what comes above is just leading up to this case. When all of these events happen, then you shall do this. You shall utterly destroy them. And now you have no vav here, but this is just explaining this. So utterly destroying them means don't cut a covenant with them. Do not pity them. Now notice that the temporal use of key from the last slide is not so different from this use of key in example two that supposedly means if. One of the leading grammars explains the not so clear cut distinction this way. A temporal clause, meaning when, is one that usually refers to a process that has a good chance of being realized. So if it has a good chance of being realized, translate it when. If it is not a good chance of being realized, say if. But then notice this one, example two, which is held up as one of those examples that means if. Uh, the older prophet came to the younger prophet, said go home, and then if you find a man, then do not greet him with a blessing. But I mean, honestly, if you're walking home, depends how far away you are from home, you're probably going to run across somebody and then in that case, don't give them a blessing. And so it's examples like this that make me question, do we really need to say that key can mean if? Why not just relegate that to im? And then for key, there's not three usages, there's only two. There's the causal, means because, and the temporal, meaning when. Now, in example two, the distinction between if and when, it seems like who really cares. But in the example of the story this week in Joshua, there is a big difference whether Joshua says, if you abandon Yahweh, 
or if he's saying when you abandon Yahweh. So I'm not saying that ki can never mean if, but I am casting doubt on that. What I'm saying is that you should expect it to mean when, and if you're saying it just means if, then I think you need to make a good case for it. All right, and just like that, we're on our last point for today, unmarked direction. We've seen some variations so far. If you want to indicate direction towards some place, Hebrew has at least two ways of doing it. The most common is using preposition el. Here's an example. God speaking to Jonah. Kum, lech el ninve. Arise, walk to Nineveh. The other example is that you can have a kometz he ending on a singular noun. It can only attach to nouns, and it can only attach to singular nouns. When it does so, it also indicates direction toward. Vayakom yona livroach tarshisha. And Jonah, Jonah here, got up to flee to Tarshish, where the noun is tarshish, the kometz he is direction towards Tarshish. So you have preposition L, and you have kometz he ending. You also have totally unmarked direction, and it just has to be understood from the context. Vayimtsa onya ba'a tarshish. And Jonah found a boat going tarshish, where we understood that it's to tarshish. Now, I guess the other logical possibility is that maybe he found a boat coming from Tarshish. But if you have direction unmarked, it's always direction to. So preposition mean can never be left unsaid and just understood. It's only L. The other thing to say is that direction towards some place has to be established in the context in order to not get L or the Kometz He ending, as we get in Jonah 1.3. So Jonah got up to flee toward Tarshish, so he wants to go to Tarshish, and then he finds a boat going Tarshish. So that boat that he found, in order for it to be any use to him, has to be going toward Tarshish. Now, we've already seen unmarked direction twice. Here's an example from a story a while back, 1 Samuel 4, 3 to 4. Here's the elders speaking after they got their butts whooped by the Philistines. Nikha elenu mishilo et aron berit Adonai. So they say, let us take for ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh. So they want to get this Ark from Shiloh. And then, Vayishlach Ha'am Shiloh. And the people sent Shiloh. Well, if they want to get this ark from Shiloh, then they better send people to Shiloh. Again, the direction toward is established in the context. And really the same thing what we saw from a previous week. Vatet Ha'aton Min Haderech. And the donkey turned from the path, vayach bil'am et ha'aton lehatota hadarech. And Balaam struck the donkey to turn it the path. Well, if the donkey turned from the path and Balaam strikes the donkey to turn it, he has to be turning it back towards the path. That's where he wants to be walking along in order to get to Balak. So, Here's the point here. Direction, you really have three options. You have L, you have Kometz He ending on a singular noun, or you could just leave it off completely and it has to be understood in the context. But in these cases, it seems like direction toward has to be established in the near context. When it is, then you could just leave off direction altogether and just have it be understood.